welcome once again to this very interesting panel on um, why science uh, should be a priority for India. And I know that there are a lot of scientists uh, who are sitting here who would say that, uh, why are you even asking that question? You know, it's, it's obvious. Uh, but you know they, they always uh, are seeing as an insider, and you would want to see it as an outsider. Uh, but without much ado, uh, I'll you know get right in and ask Rajan, um, you know who's interesting because he's had a research uh, stint in research, doing research, and now he's been doing business uh, in India. And uh, what does he think about the importance of science in India, especially? to drive the economy, to drive businesses, and please, please feel free to say if you think there are other reasons why India should also pursue science. Thanks, thanks Varun, firstly, for having me here, and it's a pleasure to be here. You know, to your point on science and its importance, see, I think science historically has always, you know, driven the human revolution and what human beings can potentially understand and be also in the future, and I think today, you know, we are at probably the most, in recent times, the most disruptive times in terms of, uh, you know, technology and human beings, everybody moving together. You know, and while we've seen industrial revolution and we've seen power and then we've seen digital and most recently the industrial revolution, uh, you know, particularly in terms of the uh, IOTs and, and all of that, I think that the deep thinking in, in for a country like India is what is society 5.0 going to be, right? So we talk of industry 4.0, really what is society 5.0 going to be? And I think Japan was the pioneering you know, thought process leader in that. And it's around centering around the human population, right? How will technology, society, both the physical and the cyber world work together to not only make people smart, but, you know, the entire society smart. And I think that's a key driver and brings to that point that ultimately for a country like India, we need an ecosystem that will drive the evo evolution of science and technology. And therefore, you know, I come from an interesting position to see how that translates into business or so commercialization of the right technology, the government's participation, you know, in making that happen. And as we were discussing just earlier this week, I had the opportunity, we spent uh, about two hours with the Prime Minister in India, and one of our key discussion points was about how do business, government, you know, financial institutions, uh, uh, everyone work together to be able to drive a s culture of innovation and an ecosystem for India. Yeah. So, you know, for example, if there are uh, researches and there are patents, how do file patents and uh, you know, uh, research designs actually become collaterals when banks are lending money to commercialization of IP, right? How can government uh, ministries actually allocate 10% of their R&D costs to work with academic institutions and with business to really bring the power of science you know, to the fore? You know, so I think it has to be a multi-stakeholder, joint kind of uh, ecosystem evolution to drive the outcomes that science is looking at achieving. So I think the need for science is definitely, like what you say, very obvious to uh, to most people, but how will we then drive that importance of science along with technology? Because you know both of them are working very closely together to drive society at whole. These are some of my opening thoughts. Right, no, and I think uh, it's interesting, right? Because the two points which are very interesting here is one that science and technology are linked, right? And sometimes people see science separately and technology separately, but there's a loop uh, between that. And that's where you're talking about the second point about commercialization of science and how to build an ecosystem where science really translates to create value for the society, right? And I like to go there to Payal because he talked about society 5.0, and a lot of your work is around how the technology, how technology as internet, mobile phones, and AI has impacted the society, and what are some of the good things and bad things uh, which have happened uh, due to that. So in that perspective, with this whole mass participation which we have on digital platforms, what do you see the role of science and technology in that? Can we use it as a resource to harness science or technology? how we can create better impact of science and technology on all these people? Yes, a great question. Um, now, I would ra rather like to couch it first in uh, addressing the main question of the panel, right, is in terms of should it be a priority? And you have to be very careful about the framing of this question because when we say this, it may give the 
uh, wrong signals that we're asking something which is very obvious because we need to sort of unpack it. Is it in terms of funding? In which case, actually, in comparative to other disciplines, it definitely gets far more funding than arts, humanities, social sciences, right? In fact, I'm coming from the Netherlands where we had one of the biggest academic protests because they cut millions of dollars in uh, funding in the humanities because they thought, well, of course, it has to be diverted towards AI, right? And uh, this is in the Netherlands, which is a very wealthy country, and this is happening across the world. So if it's not the funding, is it institutional support, right? And indeed, uh, Varun's keynote was uh, very much emphasizing that it needs to be supported on all levels, right? And on one hand, it's like, you know, a lot of Indian parents and children are aspiring to be very American, right, as you see the stats. But we fail to emulate the institutional setup, which, by the way, pushes for electives for the first two years, which is, and also compartmentalizes, so you make sure to study the humanities, the, the uh, you know, in different fields, even if you're bad at it. And then only you get to specialize. You do not specialize immediately. Why aren't we adopting those systems? Because surely these are the pathways to innovation, which, you know, we actually are, uh, we're admiring the outcome, but not the process, right? And so you have that, and then, so what are we talking about in terms of prioritization? So perhaps I would like to emphasize it should be about quality. What do we mean by quality science? Is that, are we asking the right kind of questions? We know, we have vast evidence that the kinds of questions we are asking are very oriented towards a small group of pop, uh, people. The default is often male, so whether it's like, what are male diseases? Look at the sciences and the focus on uh, cures for male uh, s symptoms, male diseases, a lot of money goes into it. Women's uh, fertility issues, it, you know, it took so long for the pill to come out, for example. So there's a huge bias in the kinds of questions being asked, right? Which means that how do we go into, I would say, prioritizing real quality science, which means thinking critically and appreciating and then thereby becoming deeply irreverent. And if we can learn to uh, like not have anything as sacred and inculcate that into our culture, which means that we need to put the arts and social science above the science, actually. Because only then can you actually succeed in utilizing it. So going to your question about, you know, how are we using these sort of, uh, you know, as the next billion users are coming online, how is this actually shifting the scientific paradigm is, in some sense, it's very interesting because we're in a data-driven economy, and so what's happening is there's a sort of a crowdsourcing of data. So in some sense, that's good because before we were imagining, right? We were pontificating entire publics. We were generalizing studies of, you know, what's happening in one context across board. Today, we are able through data analytics to understand a lot of these low-income populations or marginalized majorities who are now becoming centerfold. And we can actually learn through evidence, right? We can look at the data. It can guide us. So in that sense, but there's a more insidious part is about citizen science. It can be enabling, right? But also amateur science can question and this whole idea of like fake news, fake science, and thereby, well, I believe if you're an influencer on Twitter or Instagram, you can say what you really believe. Suddenly science becomes an opinion. And this is, I think, one of the biggest challenges. And basically, by the next million users coming online, the algorithmic sort of force can shift and put the fake before the truth because it, it becomes the popularization of science. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. No, very interesting thoughts. And we'd like to come back to the gender issue once more because that's also a theme which we are looking at. Uh, but Professor Wadia, uh, coming to you, and you have built a science institution in India. And yesterday we were having this conversation among the scientists, and one scientist said that, oh, black holes is one thing where people can really show no impact on our lives. And yet there's so much fascination in the society about it. And I know you are a theoretical physicist, and there are all these discussions about, oh, we can let, this is very expensive stuff, doesn't yield much for the society, we should leave the Westerners to do it, and we should, we are a, we are a country of a lot of poor people, and that's what we should concentrate on. So I would love to hear that, how would you convince stakeholders on why they should be looking at areas of science like which you pursue, of course, other than the broader question on uh, the priority of science in India? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Okay, so 
I'll, I'll broaden the question a little bit and uh, I won't... Uh, Sorry for putting you on the no spot. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll just try, I will not try to justify why black holes can help society, etc. <laughs> Perhaps they can, <laughs> but uh, I, I think uh, the the issue of doing science uh, with a free spirit is very important. Mm. I mean, uh, science done in institutions where there is freedom, free spirit, and uh, I think uh, most most of the important discoveries of science. I mean, history is sort of replete with examples. From Alan Turing to who, who did uh, from Alan Turing, John von Neumann, who laid the foundations of computer science, to also the uh, uh, you know the invention of uh, the uh, of the uh, MRI machines actually mm -hmm. that about uh, took about forty years from the great work of uh, Rabi actually to come to that so. Scientists must actually pursue their research in a free way because only then you can really explore knowledge space. And, uh, and discoveries can be very serendipitous. And once you sort of fill up knowledge space with uh, you know, lots of good islands, then um, other people can go and tap that. And uh, every one of the things that uh, people are talking in terms of startups or technology, every one of them can be sort of traced to very abstract, very theoretical, and uh, also experimental developments in basic sciences. Yeah, so one more thing regarding this uh, black hole business. <laughs> okay, so you know, recently the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, I showed in my talk that uh, you know, the picture of the black hole, but uh, how was this picture got actually? It was got by uh, you know, talking together of many telescopes uh, all over the world, and that required a lot of good computing mm -hmm. and computing architecture to do it, actually. So it all goes hand in hand. Okay. Yeah. okay. And maybe it led to building some of that computational architecture, right? And I think one of the points you're also making here is that development of science is nonlinear. It is not always mission-based science where we are knowing what we are solving. And we're solving something else and something else gets solved. And people you know, drive inspiration from those results even 10, 20, 30 years back. Uh, my teacher at my undergrad institution used to say that when Boolean was doing Boolean math, he never knew it would be used in electronics, right? And, and he did uh, Boolean math. Uh, coming to you, uh, Professor Kao, and I know I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Uh, uh, I have a lot of respect for what China has done in the last two decades in science and in building uh, world-class institutions. And I often quote the example of universities like Xinhua, which have become world-class and which are competing uh, with an MIT and Stanford. And uh, I must tell the audience that MIT recently uh, uh, you know, got a billion dollars to set up a school of computing. And the donor in his uh, inaugural lecture did say that he was trying to, he was threatened by China in AI. And that was one of the reasons uh, why he made uh, this donation uh, to MIT. But I'm not saying we are here all competing. We want to collaborate. And we know that science develops when we collaborate. But given that China has made science now priority almost starting the 90s, uh, what really convinced the, uh, the Chinese institutions, the Chinese government, and I don't know if the public had a role to play in it, in the Chinese public, to really start investing in China, uh, in, in science, and you know, making it a top priority at all levels. OK, OK, this is a very, very good question. So uh, basically, if you really want to become an innovative, kind of innovation kind of oriented nation, and uh, you really want to become a, a, a global scientific power, you really have to have this kind of consistent kind of government policy Right, so government does not necessarily have to put a, a tremendous amount of money into that, but the government really have to uh, put some sort of money in 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 supporting scientific research and supporting uh, uh, I mean education from K to twelve and all the way to 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 high education. Right, then you have to really try to build this kind of infrastructure, so which can afford the country to attract the be be best and brightest people, young, especially young scientists, 
to working on the issues they really want to work work on. So right, then actually as as a government, they really have to uh, uh, level the playing field by uh, setting up some sort of institutions which actually uh, stimulate the innovation uh, in the country. I mean, one of the things actually come um, I mean easily come up to to everybody's mind is kind of try to I mean protect. I mean, intellectual property rights. I mean, of course, you have a, a different kind of debates on whether, I mean, having a, a stringent kind of in IPR regime actually is good for science, at w especially in the in the in the environment of open science, open data, etc. Whether those kind of um, IP regime is good for science or not. But from from my perspective, at least in the in the early period of having this kind of institution, really is good for. Uh, for a country actually try to grow, to advance its science, basically showing the people, especially showing that, that it's its own citizens that uh, having those kind of environment, uh, protecting uh, intellectual property rights will have some sort of implications for a, a, a country going forward uh, in its science, technology, innovation. Uh, I actually want to comment on the yeah. issues just yeah. Para just ma mentioned, which is about the uh, the, the role of, of, of culture. I mean, um, I mean, you basically over the years you see this kind of divergence instead of convergence of the. I mean, on the one hand you have this kind of humanity and social science, and on the other hand you have this kind of nature science. This is a, 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 the old question. Actually, 60 years ago, I mean, C.P. Snow when he gave this very famous kind of two culture kind of lecture in the in the UK, he already brought that issue uh, up. But over the years, over these last 60 years, I mean, this issue has not been can be resolved uh, at any at any country probably. I mean, in some of the universities, basically you have those kind of liberal arts education try to, I mean, instill those kind of two knowledges to uh, to to student from 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 the beginning of their high education. But I mean, you you haven't seen I mean, much success. I mean, maybe only in a small number of countries. But by and large, globally, I mean, education is still kind of divided by. These kind of disciplines. I mean, we, li we really want to see uh, those sort of things actually coming. I mean, to be more kind of convergence. I mean, I mean for example, recently, I mean, uh, I think MIT actually uh, comes up with those kind of uh, uh, kind of policies. Try to, I mean, uh, campaigning for those kind of convergence of the uh, kind of kind of scientific discipline, uh, regardless of science. I mean, nature science, uh, humanity, and social science. I think. This would really will uh, have a good impact on students going forward to prepare uh, there for uh, what, whatever kind of kind of kind of career they are going to pursue so in the future. So I really campaign for those kind of convergence of the uh, 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 the field of disciplines. Sure. So uh, you know the quick four themes I got is one was the science ecosystem where all stakeholders like companies, uh, government, science institutions all could come together, which Rajan was speaking about. And Pyle spoke a little about what was just being reiterated out here about the convergence of science and art, and uh, uh, which I think is very interesting and an important topic to discuss. And uh, Spinter talked about original questions and original thinking and asking, being able to ask original questions. Let me ask you a few more questions and then open it to the audience. So Spinter, I know you built a very successful institution in India called ICPS, yes. which continues to do very, very well. Uh, how do we create many more ICTS? I mean, what is the template? Because ICTS is great, but we need a many, many more of those kind of institutions uh, in India. Or what would be so? My, you know, my general thought out here in this second round of questions is that what can we do to you know push science in India and make science world class? And you have built a world class institution in India. So, what are your thoughts? Okay, thank you. Uh, the institution that uh, we collectively as a community of physicists from Tata Institute and elsewhere in India built in Bangalore is really world class. But if I were to do it again, I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. sure. What I would do is uh, build a research university with emphasis on undergraduate education and liberal arts education, actually, which is extremely important. And uh, yeah, so that is the sort of scale we need in India. So, if I'm reading you right, ICTF doesn't have undergrad. That's the no. thing which you are pointing out. ICTS is part of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which does not have undergrad, undergrad program as yet. Yeah, and undergrad for the audience is bachelor level programs, uh, because the uh, Indian thing is graduate and postgraduate, and 
you know, grad is master's and PhD level program. Yes. So the point is that India today has uh, uh, about 40,000 institutions of higher learning, mm. Mm. of which only 1% is involved in research. So you can just imagine the amount of people that are missing out, this type of manpower that, uh, you know, we need to really, uh, you know, raise to levels that can help this country. And this can only be done by scaling up the universities, liberating them, you know, doing things which are, and we should follow, in my opinion, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm a product of the American education system, so I'll say it, that uh, the best universities, the best university culture is in the United States, and we should simply emulate that. Mm. I mean, adapt it to our needs and uh, our <laughs> cultural needs also. So, yeah. No, makes sense. So there's a third convergence now coming here. So it was science and arts, and now graduate programs and undergrad all converge together in a focus on research. And what he's talking about is very telling, you know, that we have all these teaching universities, but very few universities which also do research. And quickly for the audience, uh, I would, uh, you know, give a quick idea of how that happened in India. It was not that our first prime minister, uh, Nehru, did not think that research has value. But the way he thought about it was, which a lot of countries at that point thought about it like that, that research will happen at research labs, in government research labs, and teaching will happen at universities, and we created this kind of distinction. Now, what has happened in the last 60 to 70 years, if you see most of the countries, there's been now a convergence where they're seeing that a lot of research is being done well, in universities where there's an inflow of PhD students who bring new ideas and there's a constant training of uh, PhD students. If you compare Indian statistics to the rest of the uh, countries in the number of people in research labs versus universities, we are really, really skewed still towards government research labs, which are unfortunately, uh, many of them work in silos. So there's another convergence we are looking at uh, out there. Uh, uh, going to you, Payal, uh, what would you think India needs for science? And you know, what do you think is the importance of thinking about gender in science? So we have a provocative panel tomorrow, which title is Why Sci Science Needs Women, right? And uh, is it just about inclusion, or is there a lot more on saying that thinking about questions about women, including wo uh, women in science, can really benefit science and the progress of science? Yeah, so um, before I go into that, I mean, one of the things that we were talking about in terms of, uh, I agree with you, like, we need to look at best examples because the truth is that we, em we are emphasizing too much on uh, innovating new models. We don't need to. We can actually ca cut and paste because there's enough experimentation. And there's not a bad thing that we are emulating. Copying is fine, you know, but... But we have to be very careful that the American model should not be copied, you know, per se in completion because it has tremendous number of flaws, which it is suffering currently. One of the biggest is now there's a new divide, not just between research and teaching. It's about practice oriented mm -hmm. versus pure research as if you yeah, so you have these city colleges and, you know, the state universities, which are supposed to do low brow. So it's supposed to track citizens. And this is happening in Europe too, the Hochschule or in Germany, like the people who do the lowbrow skills and the highbrow. And what's happening is you have useless, smart people who think it's below their dignity to work on anything practical. And I'll give you a st small story in my field work, my first book in Almora. I met a sugar baron who was totally bankrupt, okay? He said, he said, you know what? I was making so much money and then I got so arrogant and people said, you know what, um, you are such an important person. You should not be going and talking to farmers and all these like low people in your industry. You should only deal with the IITs and IIMs. So he said, okay, I'm moving all my center to Delhi, only hiring the IITs and IIMs. And those guys came in and said, oh, talking to those people below is below my dignity. I do only strategy. So they had no idea what was going on and he went bankrupt. And this is really important is we need to humble ourselves that if you want to be good at research, you've got to get off that high horse, right? So this is these divides of any kind, whether it's disciplinary. It's, it, why are we talking about one superior than the other? Who benefits? We need to revive, forget the current models, the Renaissance thinking, right? That this is how creativity comes in, new ideas come in, and there's no shame in going into that, right? And as far as, I mean, another emphasis is 
let's stop valorizing science. Trust me, you, just because you build it doesn't mean people will use it or come, right? You could have the best like sort of scientific innovation and people are like, ah, I don't believe it. Look at what's happening in Europe with the anti-vaccination program. I mean, like people are like, yeah, great vaccines, but I think it's harmful for my children because it's evil, you know? <laughs> what are you gonna do then? I mean, how much of impact did science have? How much is it happening? So we better humble ourselves. The science communication, the building of trust is very, very fundamental, which goes back to who are we as a, like, you know, putting culture at the center. And so let's sort of humble science for what it can do to society, because it can do very, very little if you just choose not to believe it, right? And maybe if you want to speak on the gender question as well, Payal, or if you have... Yes, um, and you know, of course, uh, this is a huge issue, and there's a, already there's some acknowledgement, of course, that uh, you know women need to be acknowledged. But my problem with this question is why you know why women are important is it's al almost like an insult. Is you can just as well ask why should women be born in the society? <laughs> because we are here and we have an equal contribution. So deal with it, right? I mean, stop. I mean, it's not because women don't have confidence or they don't have this sort of, or they need to believe in themselves or they're not smart enough. You know, in spite of the patriarchal structures over centuries telling women they're not smart enough, like for example, in medicine, women c will faint with the sight of blood. That's why for the longest time, women are not allowed in the medical field. Today, I'm in the Netherlands and I teach at a university where the top medical school is run by women, 75, 80%. Why? Not because they just woke up and found themselves smart, it's because they made a small institutional adjustment in the Netherlands. They allowed doctors to go part-time, flexible working hours, Boring institutional rearrangements allowed women to become so prominent in the Netherlands in the medical business. So please, let's not even get preoccupied about why and say, why not? And I think that would be a better direction, which would be the same with whether it's caste or race or any of that, right? Sure. No, totally agree. And I, there's this very interesting book, I forget the author, who's written a book on how science has done disservice to women. Because there's a lot of things which came out of science, so-called science, which said that, oh, women can't do this and women can't do that. And that's all been proved wrong over the last uh, many, many years. But the other point which uh, you mentioned, which uh, I think is um, very, very interesting, is this dichotomy which some people create between practical or applied research and theoretical research. And as far as I see, there's a continuum and they both feed onto each other. But honestly, when you talk to a lot of stakeholders and when you talk to even the government, they would say, oh no, we should be investing in applied research rather than um, in quote unquote theoretical research. But I think there's a continuum and you really cannot do applied research, right? Uh, so I think that's a great point. Coming to you, uh, Rajan, you talked about building these science ecosystems and a lot about translation of science for social and business uh, benefit. What would be, what do you think India should be doing to make more of that happen? You know, I, <laughs> I was just uh, thinking about some of the things that even Payal said, you know, so to, to the point on, on India and what could, you know, some of those social impact things be and where it will be different from a copy paste particularly is that, you know, what is going to drive solutions in India are very different parameters compared to many other parts of the world, right? Whether it is scale, whether it is you know price performance, the price performance metric on anything that gets you know delivered or commercialized or gets used by any stakeholder in society is very different when it comes to a country like India compared to anywhere in the world. It can actually be the source of you know what we often talk frugal innovation and other things of uh, solving problems first for India, but actually leveraging that for a large number of global solutions. Yeah. So I think at a fundamental level, the way the ecosystem will work in India across specific priorities. So if we see the Niti Aayog, which has actually you know, been designed as an institution that will address the priorities for the transformation of India in the future, you know, with AI, particularly the five areas are agriculture, education, um, you know, healthcare, smart cities, uh, smart mobility. Again, being a lot of functions of, you know, applied research, but models that will, you know, then change drastically what gets delivered. Because at the end of the day, to your point as well, you know, everything, even in science going forward, has to be, 
you know, probably co-created, collaborated, because without having the inputs of everyone, you will not, be, you know, create outcomes that would, you know, satisfy, um, you know, the, 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 the real need for progress or what the way we look at it. You know, two other points I think uh, could probably look at some, some thought processes. Even into our institutions, when we look at you know education, we look at research, we look at getting similar input and then really creating different outcomes. You know, um, the, the 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 need, especially over the next ten years or twenty years, is to look at specific outcomes that are desirable by larger sets of stakeholders, and then bringing differentiated, diverse inputs to drive that outcome. So, to the point of gender, if fifty percent of the population of India are are women and the solutions have to cater to them, there's no way you cannot have that participation in enabling or creating that solution, right? So 15% women faculty in research is unacceptable. You know, it, it needs to grow to a significant percentage, right, on that sense. So I think having a focus on the outcome would run. And on the theoretical uh, science side, I think, I don't know if I'm right, but, you know, uh, Spenta would agree, but there is through quantum physics and all of that, you know, a challenge to what has traditionally been proven by science to be, you know, the way uh, we are looking at it 50 years and 100 years later. I think there's a fundamental shift again happening in some of that thought process. So to my first point where I started that we live in a, in a very disruptive world and yeah. you, you talked of disruption as being, you know, an outcome which is different from just innovation or, or change and that is really true and as disruption happens you're fundamentally changing marketplaces the way they've been and it's very hard to arrive at consensus around there so i think one of the big suggestions for india is also that you know you have a joint action group that defines new regulations adopts new sandbox principles where you can do things differently experiment quickly you know, because otherwise we will not be able to leverage outcomes uh, to the extent that we should for the amount of money, uh, the amount of time, amount of investment, amount of other things that are going in uh, to make and change the world at this pace. Sure, yeah. no, sure. And you know, and one point which um, I often think about on these disruptions is that uh, if you see a lot of disruptions are still being done by the West, right? So if you look at the internet revolution, it happened in the West. and we kind of then try to catch up, right? That's why we probably don't have the biggest internet companies in the world. And a lot of these things get built up in universities and then startups, there's a startup. So I think one thing which works very well in the US is this nexus between startups and universities, right? And they work very, very closely. But if you look at the internet revolution, the mobile revolution, and now the AI revolution, all of them, we are followers, right? So once it happens, it becomes big and then we say, oh, we need to adopt this. But then we already missed the boat if you look at creating economic um, value out of it. And so one of the questions, so one of my questions to you would be, and when you work with the Niti Aayog, is that a lot of times we don't know what will get disrupted, right? And if you're only going after themes which are getting disrupted today, we might continue to follow, then, then lead, because really science is no non-linear, right? And some like, even if you look at, at the deep learning algorithm at University of Toronto, which first came in University of Toronto in tw 2012, which is disrupting AI right now, um, for at least 20 years before the deep learning paper came, no one used to touch neural networks. It was like a paria in the AI community, right? Because, and the problem why it was a paria in the AI community was because we still don't understand why they work. You know, they're not theoretically elegant. And then this guy did this experiment and said, oh, we solved it using deep learning. So the joke is that before 2012, if you had a paper with neural network written in it, it would not be accepted at any conference. And now if you have a paper which doesn't have a neural network, it will not be accepted at any conference, right? But what I'm trying to say is that science has this nonlinear motion, right? So as much as the government might think that we can say what our priority, they would always have a blind spot. So how do you balance both of these, and I think, uh, uh, you know, there's some conflict in what Spenta was saying and what you were saying, and I'm trying to get them together. One was, you know, original questions, leaving the scientists uh, alone on doing what itself, and the other is de uh, defining some top-down priorities. So how do we manage these two? No, I think, I think both need to work hand in hand. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, the scale of or the magnitude of, you know, problems, again, as I said, if you, we believe that, the Society 5.0, which keeps the 
you know, citizen or the society member, the human being in society at the center is the future, then we cannot create, my point is the prioritization over the next 20, 30 years has to address that just because of the, you know, great time, I mean, the, the times that we live in, right? So I think um, uh, to your point, I think uh, government, India, everyone understands that yes, we have missed a lot of and therefore we historically talk about the great science that India had and I think there is great uh, intention and to your slide that you showed that 25 years later, we see India back at the forefront of science and we are really pushing a lot of things where sometimes, you know, the way we operate, we don't think of. Like today we sponsor a lot of research in India. But if we want to sponsor research overseas, so that we can enhance these, the research that is happening in India, you know, there are limitations on how much you can spend, et cetera, if you're, you know, going through certain issues. Now, getting those kinds of simple things, you know, cleared, it's very important to enhance that whole ecosystem, you know, what you said. And, and to terminology, you're absolutely right, right? I was 25 years ago, you know, when we were doing what you call of AI today, sitting at NASA, we were looking at spectral imagery, mapping, you know, the output of crop and all, and actually it was AI, but nobody will recognize it till to now when you talk of it. So, you know, it's, it's the simple things that, you know, what you said become, you know, uh, common language, you more to say, and that drives adoption and, and a lot of things. But, but I think it will always be the depth of the theoretical science and the applied, you know, research, I think that will shape the future, particularly if we want to keep the, the citizen or the human being at the core. I just wanted to make one point that uh, neural nets were first introduced by McCulloch, a uh, neuroscientist, and Pitts, who's a mathematician, in 1943. So that's the point, actually, in order to try to understand uh, human cognition. So these are fundamental questions, people. And I think, uh, you know, th this is the reason why I think in the West, people are at it. People are at it, and then suddenly there is a discovery and then okay everybody else then wants to follow uh, ju just a comment about you know when we talk about emulating the u.s i mean i d we have to talk about america as a place versus americans and you know in terms of when we're talking about as if innovations happening there and it's not happening here actually a lot of brain power went to the US, which if you look at Silicon Valley, a third of Silicon Valley is just made up of India and China. And that education happened in India, right? The culture of emphasis on learning within our families, within our communities, nurture that. And we, the people who happened to go, they were fortunate enough to capitalize on the structures that enabled them to excel. So. I really have faith in the Indian intellectualism, which we really bring to the table, and we have a legacy of that, and we are making a huge impact. And uh, similar with Asia, right, across both. And that the problem then is it creates this absolute, it feeds into this American exceptionalism narrative that America is so great and unique, but you scratch the surface, and how many of them are actually coming from the US, born, brought up, and what kind of culture? And I'm sorry, that's not actually true, right? So if we actually really be able to harness and sort of create, they, they already, the term brain circulation in the brain brain came about, where just look at what's happening, the, this event or case in question, right? Is uh, what Warren and uh, community is doing. And it's not a coincidence, and the same thing is happening, but this is not clearly enough. But we need to de-romanticize this notion of the U.S. as a special place out there with special people who are coming with special brains and ideas, right? Because no, it's made and built by many of us, right? No, no, absolutely. And to you know, Rajan's point, um, you're being applauded. <laughs> to Rajan's point, and uh, you know, I think one of the points which you talked about, and I c completely agree, right? It's some things about the institutional structure, and there are all these low-hanging fruit you know, of that you remove these barriers and science can suddenly start growing. And uh, my simile, as I was saying in my uh, talk, is uh, just, you know, in the 80s, you would say, oh, there's something fundamentally wrong with Indian businesses. Going back to Pyle's point about special about USA, and there was this idea of Hindu rate of growth. 
So there was a famous paper which came out of, if I'm not wrong, Delhi School of Economics, which said, oh, Hindus are otherworldly people, so they don't do good in business. And suddenly we liberalized the economy, and it was just the institutional change we did, and India started growing at um, 8%, right? And so they're probably simple things which you can do institutionally uh, in science to make it grow, and I like this metaphor of the economic liberalization. Professor Kao, we must have, China must have encountered all these questions, <laughs> you know, as they're developing. Uh, science over the last 20 years. So what are some of China's answers to these questions and what can we learn from it? Uh, okay, this is a very, very good question. I, I don't know how, how, how should I answer that? How can I answer that? So I said, let me start with, I mean, some sort of observations. I mean, not using the Chinese example, maybe use the example from elsewhere, right? Several years ago, I, I studied, I mean, uh, along with some US colleagues, I mean, uh, the rise of nan nanotechnology in, in different countries, right? We, we look at uh, the publications, we look at the patterns. We basically observed that uh, for those kind of big countries, right, you, you can do almost everything. You can generalize the, all the disciplines I mean, within nanotechnology. But for small countries, you are not afford to do everything, but you, you are more likely to specialize the areas where you are good at that. So, so the b b basically, the first, uh, first kind of, I mean, kind of observations uh, basically teaches me, I mean, uh, you really have to, I mean, allocation, allocate your resource, I mean, you in, a, in a wise way. So I think this is maybe also the ways uh, uh, the Chinese government, the Chinese scientists have learned from elsewhere. Because at the very beginning, they just tried to pick up the areas where they, they think China is at the front, front uh, frontier, that China has the potential to become, uh, uh, or p have the potential to become a kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of leader in, or, or one of the leaders in, in some particular area. So secondly, I mean, when the country actually advanced scientific, I mean, I mean, so dramatically, so then at th that point that that country has to re reflect on what kind of lessons they learned from 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 its kind of progress. For example, in the Chinese case, I mean, recently there has been a lot of discussion on whether China actually has achieved a very very fundamental kind of breakthrough in in the area of scientific research in science, right? You, if you take a look at what China has achieved technologically or in, in, the, in, in the area of innovation, China probably is one of the uh, leading countries in the world. But uh, in some of the critical technology, the basically the science of China has not contributed so much to the global science per se. Right? Let's take a look at uh, in terms of number of Chinese scientists winning a Nobel Prize. There's, there's only one Chinese scientist actually uh, 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 educated uh, and working within China actually become Nobel laureate, right? So that's the only case. So compared to our neighboring country, Japan, I mean, in the past, I mean, 30, 30, 20, 30 years, I mean, they have contributed, uh, I mean, about 20 uh, Nobel Prize, um, um, Nobel laureates in, in science, right? So that's in basic science area. But in the areas of technology, I mean, I mean we, we, we learned from recent cases of ZTE and Huawei, if something happened, uh, International. We, uh, I'm talking about China right now is not facing a friendly international environment. If some country says we are going to cut the, the technology from its source, from the from its origin, countries like China would have some sort of difficulties, right? Because I mean, um, in the areas of technology, um, let's take a look at the communication technology, even the area in the area of AI. I mean, basically three key areas of in AI development. Chips, I mean, algorithm, and uh, and also uh, 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 what is uh, the AI I mean, so three key areas. I mean, China uh, does not have any kind of advantages. China is good at, or maybe possess, possess a lot of uh, uh, data, and also the the kind of kind of legal environment is not as stringent in terms of protection of data privacy and etc. So. I think these are the areas really China really s need to learn, and uh, advanced developed countries have to learn. That is, you really have to focus on, uh, 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 I mean, allocate a certain part of the resources into basic science, and at the same time, you have really solved the problem of not just being a follower. Try try to make breakthrough in certain areas of technology. What, what I really like about China, while I was um, hear hearing from him, is that it's very self-critical. Right, and they constantly raise the bar, right? Unfortunately, in India, sometimes if a study says we are not good in something, we challenge the study, rather than saying how to correct it. But I think we are having a very good in a discussion going on. 